Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm excited to be joined by a very special guest today, Mr. Chris Barton, the founder and first CEO of Shazam, the iconic app that's been downloaded over 2 billion times to date. As you may know, Shazam was acquired by Apple for $400 million. We're going to be talking about Chris's journey to that place, along with what he's doing today. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on with So to kick things off, I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning. Where were you and what initially sparked the idea for Shazam? Um, you know, it was sort of a, there's sort of a two stages to the idea, really. Um, there was stage one where um, I thought, well, I, I kept a list of songs that I liked. I hear them in, in many different places, bars, clubs, cafes, theaters, you name it. And I would ask people, what, what's that song? I'd write it down on a little list. And then uh, over time, I'd then make a little, add it to a mixtape that I would make. Um, and this is way back when mobile phones were just dumb phones. They were not smartphones. Um, right. So my first idea was, oh, you know, it'd be great if you could use the phone to identify songs. Um, and uh, that stage one part of the idea, I was going to use what existing technologies. So the existing technologies monitored thousands of radio stations. And so you could get a feed of that information. Um, and I was going to do something that actually many other startups were working on as well, which is just tie into that. And then you would be able to type in the name of the radio station you're listening to, and it would tell you the name of the song that you're listening to. Um, now, you can imagine that'd be a little bit clunky as an experience because you have to type in a radio station every time or, um, into your phone. And then also it's limited because you couldn't use it when it's not radio. So bars, clubs, cafes, theaters, shopping malls, a lot of these places, it's not radio or if it is, you don't know the radio station. Um, right. and, so the real, the, and the real breakthrough idea was then thinking, oh, my gosh, if what if I did build this, what could someone do that would leapfrog me and make me irrelevant? Um, and then I thought, oh, my gosh, what if someone could just do it from the sound coming to the phone on the microphone and you weren't limited to just what's on the radio? You weren't even limited. To, you didn't even need to know what's playing on the radio. You didn't even need to tie into these technologies that monitored thousands of radio stations. And um, and so that was the breakthrough aha moment. That was the idea that no one had ever had. And frankly, it was impossible at the time. There was no technology to do it. Um, but anyway, that 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 was uh, that was the key breakthrough. I was actually living in London at the time I came up with that aha moment. Um, and I decided I really wanted to pursue that dream. Wow, that is awesome. Uh, you uh, you had this idea really before the technology was really available yet. So you kind of had to push it along, right? Yeah, that's what made it really interesting and it's quite unique for Shazam is that many, many startups or even most startups start from a technology that's invented and then an entrepreneur thinks, hey, let's turn this into a business. Um, but in this case, uh, it was a little bit crazy looking back, but we, you know, myself and I, I had uh, a couple other co-founders that I brought on board to help build the business, but um, we really started with a, hey, this is a vision. Now we got to create a technology to back it up. And I think we didn't quite realize what we were getting into. But what we found when we reached out to the experts in this area, which included professors from Stanford and MIT that were electrical engineering, signal processing, audio technology experts, they, they, we found that, hey, this, there is no technology that can do this. And they had no idea how to create it, how to invent it. It just was not feasible because it was it was a really, really difficult technology to create because when you when you create what's called pattern recognition, it was an early version of AI, basically artificial intelligence. Um, when you create pattern recognition and you have two problems that you're trying to solve at the same time, solve for, and those two problems include noise and scale. So noise being background sounds, people talking in bars and so on, and then scale, you know, checking against a database of, of not just 10 songs, 100 songs or 500 songs, but millions of songs. When you combine those two problems, pattern recognition often becomes impossible. Um, so yeah, the example I sometimes give is imagine trying to find your best friend in a room with 30 people, you'd say, he or she's right there. Now try to find your best friend in Wembley Stadium, right? That's difficult. You can't do it. It's noise and scale at the same time, challenging your human brain. Absolutely. Now that's a big time challenge, no doubt about it. And I also understand through your work, you have created 12 patents, including work at Dropbox and Google. There's a keynote speech you delivered where you talk about the mindset that can lead to great innovation. What do you mean by that? 
Yeah, so I'm a, yeah, I have, I have to admit I, I I'm an addic addicted inventor. I I, I uh, both with Shazam, but also as you mentioned at Google and Dropbox, it was I would just come up with these ideas and I think, wow, we should really be able to do this, and and then um, be able to come up with what has to be a novel idea to get approved as a patent. And it was fun for me to 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 go that route and to kind of create new things. Um, I really dug into what 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 led to this great outcome of Shazam because Shazam was not easy. I mean, Shazam almost failed multiple times and there were multiple challenges that that led to it almost failing including coming up with a, an idea that was not good enough as i mentioned the radio recognition initially um, and then also including you know how are we going to invent this technology that all these professors are saying is impossible how are we going to raise money in incredibly difficult times when some of the venture capitalists said hey this is you know i don't even see why people would use this feature and you have to keep in mind this is before smartphones um, you know, establishing a way to build this experience in the old phones before there were apps and so on, um, which involved partnering with large mobile phone companies, all these huge, basically nearly insurmountable challenges. Um, so I dug into like, well, you know, what led to this great success, you know, so because we ultimately created magic, we created something that drove 2 billion downloads, it became a verb, it became something that people literally can set, tell you, I remember the first time I used this. And how right. many products does that happen for? I mean, how many products can you think of where you remember the first time you used it? I mean, even maybe your MacBook, you may not remember that. But luckily with Shazam, many people can actually remember that moment. Um, so uh, I kind of dug into it and thought, well, how did we get there? And I really was able to kind of um, distill down to these kind of five key mindsets that I really think led to the successful outcome of Shazam, led to this sort of ways of thinking differently and led to this led to this um, ability to get overcome these barriers, achieve the impossible, come up with really breakthrough unique ideas and develop something that is really delight, delightful to, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of customers. Um, what's interesting about them is that they're all things that we don't do by default. And so I have, I, I call it start from zero um, and I've given them sort of five names. Um, they're built from basic truths, um, picking a uh, creative persistence, picking your obsession, eliminating friction and connecting to emotions, but with digging into them and we can elaborate a little bit more uh, as we go through the discussion today. Um, but really the, uh, what's fascinating about them is that they're not the default ways of thinking. Um, and so you have to be cognizant of that. And then sort of once you become aware of how to think differently, you can actually divert a little bit, divert the way you're thinking in order to achieve this, this sort of great game-changing innovation. Awesome. I love it. And in the case of Shazam, you shared a story on your website about an investor that said, I don't know why anybody would ever use this. And then later you had a conversation with that same person. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, that was a, a part of the long journey uh, of Shazam. And, you know, I have to say, as I mentioned, there were a lot of in, nearly insurmountable challenges. And, and one thing I like to talk about in my keynotes is that is how a, when uh, when you achieve something that everyone told you you cannot achieve, that's one of the most satisfying things that you can do in life. Um, but yeah, along the along the road of Shazam, uh, we pitched to over 100 venture capital firms trying to raise money in extremely difficult times just after the dot, the dot com bubble popped. So venture capitalists were just not investing they were actually fighting fires for their existing investments. Um, and um, and they were just not interested in new investments, particularly consumer investments like we were. Uh, and um, one very large, famous venture capital firm that will, will, shall remain unnamed, um, the, the sort of managing director of that firm, uh, he looked at our demo, I showed it to him in, in their offices, and he, yeah, he literally said, I, I don't see why anyone would ever use this. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I have to, I really, uh, I, I really got sort of quite emotional. I actually said, oh yeah, well, let's go out into your office and ask all the people sitting in those seats if they would use this. And um, he responded by saying, you know, that he wished all his entrepreneurs had that level of passion because I, I was so determined to convince him that uh, this would be a popular uh, experience for users on mobile phones. But it's, it's hard to convince people of that. Um, I have to uh, I have to say that one of the most satisfying experiences in my life was many years later, and we're we're talking about ten years later, um, when Apple is uh, where Apple was releasing sort of the most popular apps in in and in its app store and describing what they were, and of course there are big companies like Google and Facebook and so on in those apps. Um, 
there was Shazam among the top 10 most popular apps. And I have to, I did go searching through all my uh, archives and find this person. I had to go back. I just had to. Um, as much as I like, would like to say I'm not an I told you so kind of person. Um, and I got his contact details, reached out to him, and I wrote an email saying, it turns out people will use this. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, and it was, it was so satisfying as an entrepreneur to be able to prove that your vision was right. Um, we actually ended up meeting up for, for lunch and had a good laugh about how it's really hard to predict what's going to be successful and what's not going to be successful. Um, and, um, but it, uh, that was definitely a key, a key motivator for me when, when, when those types of things were said to me, um, you know, this is going to be impossible. You won't be able to do it. You won't be able to get the partnerships. You won't be able to invent the technology. You won't be able to raise the money and maybe no one will even use it. Um, it just would actually give me even more motivation uh, to to try to be able to prove them all wrong. Right. Absolutely. <clears throat> yep. Um, I've been fortunate to work in nine countries on supply chain projects around the world. And certain people along the way said, there's no way you can do this, that, the other thing. Right. And you just have to do it. And um, we are working in the green technology space and there's challenges there and things that have to be overcome, but you just have to keep pushing through, you know, keep on pushing forward. And I love that story. That is so awesome. Um, so what would you say are some key things that make a product successful? Yeah, actually. Um, so I think, you know, one that I like to obsess with is one that we all pay a lot of lip service to but in my opinion, we don't actually go as far as we need to go. And that is sort of, a, I call it eliminate friction. Um, and it's, it's, you know, many people think of it as simplicity, but it's not just simple. It's not just simplicity um, because simplicity tends to focus on the product itself. Is it easy to use? Um, but eliminate friction really sp speaks to the end to end experience. Um, and so there's some aspects of a product that can involve friction, but it may not it may not mean that it's difficult to use. So for example, you might have a really easy to use, um, I don't know, phone, but you might have to, you might have to, in order to get that phone working, you might need to know, you know, some information. You might, maybe you have to enter in a new account that involves going and digging up your tax records or whatever. All these types of things are friction, right? And, and so what I like to do is I like to, I like to focus on the end to end experience from the moment someone thinks about using a product or service all the way through to after they've used it and getting the benefits from it. Where are there points of friction? Where are there things that they have to think or things that they have to do? Think or do. And within think and do, there's actually many, many, many things that you might have to think or that you might have to do. Register, register um, sign up, uh, click several times, um, wait. Just waiting is, is a form of friction, you know, wait for the result. Um, maybe when you get a result, it's uncertain. Um, and the uncertainty is also a form of friction. Um, so, so sort of there's, there's many, many, many areas where friction can occur. And often what happens is when products are created because we're under pressure to, to deliver and we have deadlines because we need to get products out, we tend to say, oh, well, all the user will have to do is this. And that this, that this is actually significant for us to eliminate that piece of friction is a can be a lot of work and would slow us down tremendously um, but we often don't because we need to get the product we want to get the product out um, uh, one example i love to give is um, dropbox so before dropbox there were many companies that had cloud cloud storage and with most of these companies um, there was x drive i drive you name it um, they just had one step they said hey you just have to click upload and then your stuff was in the cloud and then when you wanted to get it back from the cloud you just click download just one step um and um and and so those companies and those founders and those teams thought oh yeah they just have to do this one step now dropbox said okay even that one step is too much and and, and what dropbox had to do to avoid that one step was incredible i mean it was like they had to conquer synchronization which is a very difficult technical problem with many edge cases of where things can, can go wrong and if anything does go wrong you lose all your data so it can't go wrong um, and then they also had to conquer hacking into the file and folder systems of, of mo multiple operating systems uh, across different computers in all in order to create this experience where everything in a folder was also in the cloud and every time you changed it it synchronized with the cloud and there was no click to upload or click to download the one step. And when I joined Dropbox, I spent several years there. Um, 
I love, they told me this story. They said, Chris, our predecessors had one step and we have zero steps. And the difference between zero and one is infinite. Right. It and makes it a mar basically creates a market. Right. Yeah, and, and I love that because it's a mathematical truth, right? That the difference between zero and one is infinite. Um, but also that that one step really um, is what held back people from adopting, you know, really embracing um, cloud the cloud until Dropbox came around. Um, so anyway, so so this eliminate friction is such a key thing to creating great products and services. Is how do you create things that are just like they just work, they just happen, they're like magic, and you and you just they're so delightful that the consumer just feels like they barely had to put any effort in in order to reap the rewards of the delightful experience. Awesome advice. Love it. So uh, for those who want to get more information about your work and your keynote speaking services, can you please let our audience know what are the best ways to connect? Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm an active keynote speaker. I love to uh, inspire large audi audiences or, or small audiences um, uh, with with the stories that I that I bring from Shazam and and Google and Dropbox, but also the key actual insights and so what you can do to think differently, to to collaborate, to to be creative um, and to innovate. Um, and uh, my website's chrisjbarton.com. Very simple. Uh, www.chrisjbarton.com. You can also just find it by googling founder of Shazam. And often it comes up pretty high up in the results. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be a pleasure to connect with anyone who um, is interested in a, a keynote speaker. And um, it was just is a pleasure to be uh, on your podcast. Well, I appreciate that. And you know, I went to your website before I had you on and got to talk with you offline a little bit. You've got some really inspirational things on your website. I want to encourage everybody go out there and check it out. It's really really good stuff. So um, this final question is one that I ask all of my guests. What would you say as a final word of advice for our friends out there listening or watching today? You know, I think uh, my advice is really is to really stay true to your passion. I mean, it, it sounds so obvious, but frankly, it's not done enough. Um, and, you know, wh where do you see what, what, because when you're really passionate about something and where you really see an opportunity, it is incredible how your brain will just start to get very creative and, and really have line of sight into how you can actually make a mark in that particular area and change the world in your own, uh, in your own personal way. Um, you become personally connected to that, emotionally connected, um, and then the end result is what ends up being uh, so far beyond uh, what, what everyone else is expecting and, and what's generally out there, all because you're putting your passion into this thing that is personal to you. So that's really my main focus. You know, that was this, that's how I made Shazam successful. And, and for each of my endeavors, when I'm really excited and passionate about something, um, the end result is very clearly so much better than when you're just sort of doing something because people say it's a good thing to do. Right. Well, you've shared some amazing golden nuggets, Chris. Uh, I really, really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. That's going to do it for our show today. Thanks for listening or watching, everybody. We will see you again soon. Take care. Mm -hmm.